Uh, that helps keep the audio uh, better for everyone. And uh, there will, will be opportunities for questions. And we ask that you use the chat box feature, which is located on the little panel. And if you hunt around for that, you should be able to find a little box where you can type in a question and then submit that. Oops. Um, the Department of Ecology will be posting the uh, PowerPoint presentations to the EMS website. And I believe we'll send out a link to that website so you can get to that in information. It'll have all of our uh, webinars on there, as well as some of the tools that we've been uh, providing folks during the series. So with that, um, I had a few introductory slides uh, before I'll introduce our, our, our speakers this morning. Yeah. All right, next slide. So this is just a quick uh, overview of, of the series. We've, we've done uh, two of these uh, webinars so far, sort of introduction to EMS. Uh, next slide. And this next series that we're moving into today is a focus on um, a deeper dive, I'd say, into environmental management systems implementation. Uh, and today we're focusing on monitoring and measurement. On December 4th, we'll do uh, the next phase of that, which is going to be focusing on communications and, and engagement on December 4th. And I believe that will be at a different time, uh, 10 o'clock Pacific Daylight Time. Next slide. And then uh, we'll take a little break uh, during the holiday season, come back after the first of the year and focus on the auditing portion of the environmental management systems. Uh, we'll have two sessions hosted by the auditing roundtable. We'll be setting those dates here shortly and get, those, uh, get that information out to you. All right, next. So again, I'd just like to remind folks that uh, this series is both for folks that are just implementing environmental management systems or maybe uh, well invested and have a lot of experience in, in the EMS program. It's something that ecology has provided as an alternative uh, to the, our traditional pollution prevention planning uh, since about 1996. And we have quite a number of companies that have taken advantage of that opportunity. And again, it, it provides flexible uh, abilities for companies to use this in lieu of traditional pollution prevention planning. And it's designed to be a collaborative approach with ecology. Um, next slide. And so I just wanted to remind folks that, um, again, work with your ecology staff at the earliest opportunity. We have dedicated uh, engineers and scientists in our four regional offices that can assist you with this process, help answer questions, um, and support your needs there at your facility. Uh, the next part of it is just to submit a request uh, about your EMS, how it meets the planning criteria. And in a minute, I'll show you a little checklist that you can use to help help you on that. Um, Ecology will review uh, some level of documentation, EMS documentation, uh, for review and then collaboration. Next. Then it's about setting up a, a site visit to go through and uh, review the EMS to kind of kick the tires, see how it's operating on the field, in the field. And um, then there are a couple requirements. One is a, a periodic uh, assessment uh, conducted by the facility. And this could be up to every five years. But we typically recommend three based on you know, the typical EMS kind of uh, auditing process. But nothing hard and fast in stone there. We just require every five years because of our state planning law must be submitted every five years. And then uh, we do require uh, an annual progress report. And we're uh, using a new tool called TurboPlan, which is a web-based uh, uh, process to allow you to, to submit your documents. Or you can continue to just email supporting documents to our regional staff. Next slide. Th again, just to remind you, here's the quick criteria. It's fairly straightforward. This is also available on our, our website through guidance. There's three, male, uh, three main elements policy, implementation, and then monitoring and measurement. Next slide. So I wanted to just bring this back. Uh, last month, we looked at the self-assessment checklist. And I made a few little tweaks to it. 
uh, nothing significant. Uh, added on here uh, a regional ecology contact, and then the reporting year that your EMS becomes active. Sometimes it you know maybe take a year or so to get one to the point where you you know want to you know participate in the alternative program, um, and then. Uh, this, this is designed basically to kind of highlight the things ecology is looking for and allows you to sort of check off, okay, is it in my EMS documentation? If so, uh, it's available either on a, you know, what page of the document or maybe it's on a website. Um, is it addressed in a periodic self-assessment? And has ecology been out there to, to uh, step through that? And so this could be done over a period of time. Next slide. Uh, continues through whoop, on the implementation side, you're setting objectives and targets, and uh, our P2 plan requires at a minimum both addressing hazardous substance use as well as hazardous waste reduction, but acknowledges there are other um, things that can be included. Typically folks uh, include air, water, and waste issues. And some organizations are moving into sustainability where they're starting to bring in social and economic uh, issues as well. Uh, there's also information about roles and responsibilities and training. We'll be getting into a little more detail today on that. And then monitoring and measurement, the, the assessment, and then the uh, annual progress report. And I've included a link to Ecology's new turbo plan uh, tool. So I guess we want to do, we've been doing uh, on the on the spot polls part of our webinars before we start into the main function. So Angela will put up our question of the week. And I was curious about where folks are in this process as we talk about an EMS manual or some kind of documentation. I um, was curious for the attendees today whether you have a, a formal EMS manual already in place. Um, so we've got yes, no, or maybe. And this is just an informal, kind of fun thing to do, quick poll. So go ahead and vote on that. And then we'll move to the next results. And Angela will put those up for us. All right, well, this is interesting. Um, throughout the series, we've had a really good distribution of the folks involved uh, with EMS. So 38% um, are showing you have some type of formal documentation. 35% have something, but we're working on it. And others are just uh, getting up to speed. Well, now I'd like to turn it over to our two presenters today uh, for the main part of the session. Uh, we have uh, Ann Vogelmar with the Executive Director for the Stewardship Action Council and Charlotte Valentine who's the program manager there. Uh, the Stewardship Action Council is one of our partners to do the uh, webinar series. And uh, they're focused on supporting uh, environmental management systems as well as improving social and environmental performance for organizations. Uh, Anne is also, um, has been their executive director there for some time. And she's also done work with uh, a lot of folks in the corporate arena on developing their EMS and corporate social res responsibility programs. And so we're very pleased to have uh, the Stewardship Action Council today. I believe Charlotte will be starting off giving a little bit of background on the organization and some introductory slides. So Charlotte? Thank you, Ken. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, go to the next slide, and I'll do an overview. OK, today's webinar is going to discuss the four elements that make up a successful EMS and how management can ensure each element is properly Im implemented. Um, but before we get started, I'm just going to talk about SAC a little bit. Um, so next slide. So the Stewardship Action Council is a nonprofit, membership-driven organization based in Washington, DC. Our membership is open to any organization who believes sustainability is better achieved when we work together than apart. For this reason, our membership represents a variety of sectors. Uh, through the mechanisms listed on the slide, we are able to promote and advance a more sustainable world. We have uh, more information on our website at stewardshipaction.org. Uh, SAC is also proud to be leading the North Texas Municipal Sustainable 
Materials and Pollution Prevention Forum, which is an EPA grant-funded project. Uh, the forum provides an opportunity for uh, the North Texas local governments to convene and address environmental impacts in the region. Okay, so getting started with today's webinar. Uh, every employee plays a role in the EMS system. And while you may be well aware of um, the role that you play in the system, it's important to know and understand how each um, employee's role interacts together, even if that's not something that you're necessarily doing. So each part of the EMS system is dependent upon the other parts functioning as intended. Failure of one part of the system can result in a failure of the system as a whole. Therefore, the role each person plays is absolutely critical, and every employee at your organization can make a difference in the system. Next. So why have an EMS? Um, EMSs are the result of internal and external forces that dictate uh, the need for a program. Uh, the EMS system incorporates meeting the compliance requirements for the facility and sets goals for continuous improvement. In the state of Washington, having an EMS in place can replace some of the P2 requirements. Next slide. So what happens when you do not have an EMS in place? Um, some of the issues that you can encounter are a reactive response to problems. For example, if a facility makes a change uh, to process equipment and then learns after the uh, equipment is installed that it needs a, a permit. Um, another problem can be recurring problems where a compliance audit finds a problem with the wrong labels on waste drums. The problem is then fixed, but it happens again a few months later. Uh, overwhelmed specialists. Uh, the potential for unidentified risks of surprises, such as environmental permits not, are not being obtained for activities during an outage. The schedule gets delayed, causing added expense and inconvenience. Also, uh, inability to capitalize on opportunities to improve environmental performance and reinventing the wheel leading to inefficiency. Uh, changes can cause upsets and compliance problems. Uh, for example, if the environmental manager wins the lottery and skips town, and then compliance uh, problems arise quickly. So, um, next slide. Uh, how would you recognize an organization with a strong EMS that um, avoids the problems mentioned in the previous slide? A strong EMS has a consistent approach that facilitates continuous improvement. Mistakes are caught before they become bigger problems clear guidance, and employees understanding their role so that if a key person is absent, the, the system will operate smoothly. At the top, management has the tools to know the status of performance and how to manage and maintain it. Next slide. One of management's tools is following the four elements of an EMS. This cycle uh, can be repl um, replicated to manage a variety of issues, not just environmental um, uh, problems. So uh, starting with the policy, the forest cycle um, consists of planning, meaning that risks and impact are, uh, impacts are identified. In other words, think about the effects that our activities may have and then set goals to reduce them. Next is the in implementation of policy and planning to ensure that actions are taken to control risks and impacts such as procedures, checklists, training, and documentation. Uh, the next step is to check, correct, and prevent to make sure that what needs to be done is actually getting done. For example, measuring to make sure uh, that you have met your emissions limit, reviewing records, and conducting audits. And the final step is to review, to step back and look at the system as a whole and see if it's working. And now for a more detailed review, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Vogelmar, who will um, discuss the implementation of monitoring and measuring. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'm happy to be here. I'd like to welcome all of you to the webinar. And wanted to let you know that we, the following slides are going to be, have a lot of detail in them. And in putting these slides together, we took the approach of putting more information on the slide rather than less to enable you all to go back and use the slides afterwards as guidance. So we won't be talking to every item on the slide. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we do have contact information for myself and for Charlotte. So if over the next convening weeks or months you have questions or something comes up and you would like some additional uh, information, please do feel free to call either Charlotte or myself, and we'd be happy to make ourselves available. 
Okay, the slide that you're looking at here is an example of an EMS toolbox that a client that I have worked with has used and has given us permission to share. In this instance, the client was a larger organization that had multiple facilities, and they wanted an EMS that was implemented in a systematic way across their organization. What you see here uh, are the areas that they identified um, as part of their system, and then the non-bolded items are things that they put in a toolbox that all of their facilities could access. So this gives you a sense when you are implementing a system of the types of things that you, if you do have multiple sites, that you might want to make available, or the types of things that if you have one site, you might want to work on individually. Next slide. This is, a, again, same client, um, different uh, aspect or different visual for an EMS. This was the flow chart that they pre prepared to demonstrate the elements of the system and how they were all going to work together. Um, I just thought it would be a useful tool for you guys to see, beg, borrow, or steal from if you would like, um, but I wanted to put it in there as a tool that you could use if you saw fit. Next slide. Okay, so when you're implementing and monitoring, considering implementation and monitoring of a system, this is all about how you do what you do. Um, this is the on-the-ground controls that you are going to put in place to maintain compliance, to minimize your risk, and to achieve the goals that you're setting. And there are a few key elements that you are going to use to do that. Uh, one is to implement programs and procedures that can serve as the controls. The second is the roles and responsibilities that you will assign to your staff um, to ensure that the, the key elements that need to occur are occurring. Maintaining records and documents to show um, both show what you expect to happen and then to demonstrate it, that it has happened. Uh, and communication to everyone in the organization to make sure that they understand what the system is, how it's going to work. And then lastly, training your employees. And we're going to talk about each of these in turn. Next slide. OK, so when you are considering implementing controls, um, I'm, I'm probably stepping back here to something that was covered in the last webinar, and I will not spend a lot of time on it. But you need to identify the risk for which you want controls in place. And to do that, for each risk, you've got to determine whether you have control or influence over it, whether, what would be impacted, air, water, waste, people, soil, whatever it might be, the seriousness of the impact, where the impact will occur, and the likelihood that it's going to occur. And for each risk, you want to identify the controls that you have in place. Um, if, if the controls are missing, you want to note that. And where controls may be inadequate, you want to note that as well. Next slide. This is an example. I apologize for the small text, but I want to fit in as much information as I could. Again, an example from one of the organizations that I've worked with. This deals with their bulk chemical storage. What they did was put about 10 people, their senior managers, in a room for a period of two to three days. And they walked through every aspect of their operation, identifying what risks they potentially had, either in an activity or in equipment, um, the aspects that a risk could result from, uh, whether they had control or influence over it, what was impacted, uh, flora, so soil, groundwater, whatever it might be. Um, the A and P is whether it was an actual or a potential. Um, a spill is potential, something going up the stack that it routinely goes up the stack it would be considered actual. The significance if the impact would occur, the likelihood that it will occur, and then a list of controls in the far column. And then what they did was they took those controls and they assessed whether the ones they had were adequate, whether there was a risk for which they didn't have a control, and in many instances they discovered that there was. Um, or through their discussions they discovered that some of the controls that they had needed to be improved. Uh, and what they ended up with was a master list of all of their risks, all of their impacts, all of the controls that they had, and a ranking to determine what was significant, what needed attention, and what was being controlled adequately. Next slide. OK, so for the control, for when you're in the process of implementing controls, we're going to deal with implementing controls a little bit before we go to measuring and monitoring them. The, the key is to prioritize your efforts by starting with the most serious risk first. You want to determine if a control is inadequate, what improvements you need to make to it, or if it's missing, what you want to do to implement a control for that. You do not want to over-control. Often the simplest controls will work best. When I'm in the field doing assessments and looking at um, systems, often the ones that are the most complicated are the ones that fail first. So keeping it simple is, is a good um, method to follow. You do want to talk to your employees, because the folks on the ground are really going to have the best idea about what works and what doesn't. 
um, and they, as we will talk about as we go through the, through the webinar today, they are going to be a key source of information for a lot of different areas of your system. And then once you've identified the controls that you want in place, um, you go ahead and implement them and make sure that you follow through to make sure that they are actually implemented and in place and working. Next slide. Okay, so big picture, key questions to consider when you're implementing controls. Um, the first one is how, we, how are you going to ensure that the task is accomplished? Once the control is in place, how are you going to know if it's working? Um, do, you, do you want records to be kept? Do you want to document it in a procedure? Uh, what are you going to need to do to ensure that the task is accomplished as intended? Uh, how, how have you communicated the expectation to the folks that are going to be responsible for it? Sometimes changing a procedure will be the first step, but then there's some training or some communication with your staff that needs to happen afterwards so that they know what change has been made. Who is responsible to complete the task, roles and responsibilities is a key element and a place where we, I often can track a lot of system failures. Um, have the people been trained? Do they have the resources necessary? And by resources, we don't just mean dollars. It could be um, equipment, it could be training, it could be um, staff to, to administer or to implement the control. Um, and is there a backup if the key person is unavailable? Um, again, a key area where we see a lot of system failures. Uh, next, you want to make sure you have champions for your system. Um, you can have a system that runs beautifully, but it's running beautifully on the shoulders of one person who is, uh, my term for them is a hero. They're fantastic. You cannot live without them. Um, but when they leave, the system completely ceases to function. Um, and in that case, you really don't have a functioning system, although it may seem at the time as you do. Uh, you want every employee and, and the responsibilities for the system spread fairly wide across your organization. And then lastly, plan for change. Um, when changes occur, that's often where you will see a, an issue arise in a system. Um, so a strong management of change procedure or uh, program in place to manage change and following the changes through your system can be key. Next slide. When you have um, a strong monitoring and measuring system in place and strong controls in place, you'll be able to evaluate your environmental performance on a regular basis, analyze root causes of problems, ensure compliance and assess compliance with the requirements that are applicable to you, identify areas that require corrective action, and then implement those corrective actions with the overall result of improving your performance and increasing efficiency. Next slide. OK, so with monitoring and measuring, um, we've talked a little bit about how you implement controls. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how you monitor and measure them. There are a number of sources of information that will come in to you um, about your system. They can come from outside sources, such as compliance audits, EMS audits, regulatory agency inspections. Um, and those are very valuable and should be used to the utmost. But ideally, you want to be able to find problems internally before others see them. So we're going to spend some time today talking about how you best do that. Uh, routine inspections, monitoring of your facility, facility walk-arounds, I cannot emphasize how valuable these are. Out of your office, into the plant, walking around, um, you can do it ad hoc and just look, or you can, can do it systematically and plan to look at a particular process, and I would strongly recommend both. Uh, and the more folks you have assisting in this process, the better. Next slide. The first step is to clearly identify your needs. There is a lot, in any given plant, there's a myriad of things that can be met, monitored and measured, and you can really get caught up in the details. So you want to start with the critical items that you really need to know are working. Um, obviously, compliance is a key one. Um, goals that you have set for the organization, if you want to make sure you're meeting your goals, are another one. So start simple. Start with the key ones, and then as those get in place and as they're functioning, you can build and add additional ones. Um, but you can be overwhelmed very early on if you look at everything that you could monitor and measure and try to tackle it all at once. Next slide. These are nine key areas um, that I would um, look for monitoring or measuring in. The top line, obviously, um, the most critical. You want to you want to monitor and look at operations that have significant impacts or potentially significant impacts. You want to make sure your oper operational procedures, where you've deemed it important to have a procedure, you want to make sure it's working and compliance with legal requirements. 
The next tier, um, if I'm if I'm going to prioritize, the next tier I would look at would be contractor activities. A lot of facilities have contractors coming in doing some pretty key operations on site. Employee roles and responsibilities. Again, that that's a key one for a system. And then the document and record keeping practices to make sure that what you think is happening is happening. Um, and then obviously the performance against targets and objectives. Um, monitoring your equipment to make sure it's functioning as you want it to, and the effectiveness of your, of your training are the other things that I would target initially for monitoring and measurement. Next slide. All right, so when you're monitoring and measuring operational procedures, um, one of the best ways to do it is to pick a procedure. Pick a critical one that you're really interested in. Get familiar with the procedure if you're not already. And then if you can, without being observed, watch somebody performing that procedure. Um, once you're done watching them and you've compared what they're doing to the procedure, talk to them and identify whether they followed the procedure you know, verbatim, whether they did some things that weren't in the procedure, or whether they um, omitted some of the things that were in the procedure. The question then becomes, why did they do things that weren't in the procedure? What didn't they do that was? Um, or if, if they followed it verbatim, you know, do they believe that other people that are responsible for the same procedure also follow it the same way? What you're trying to figure out is whether the procedure is adequate to manage the risk. Um, if, it, if it's written the way you want it done and people are not following the procedure, you want to figure out why. Um, maybe they weren't trained or maybe the procedure was changed and they haven't been made aware of the change. Or maybe for some reason they just feel that step is not important. Um, but you want to figure out why and you want to make sure that if it's important enough to have it written in the procedure, that the procedure really does reflect what you actually want done and that the folks that are implementing it are following it. Next, you want to go out and check the records to make sure that any documentation that is maintained for that particular procedure or operation um, reflect what's done, when it's done, how often it's done, and that the records accurately reflect what's done. So if there is a large gap in the record, um, the gap is not because it wasn't done, but it's because somebody forgot to fill out the record, or it wasn't done, in which case you need to go looking for why it wasn't done. Next slide. Questions to consider when evaluating your system from an operational procedure standpoint. And this goes back to the, to the um, high level. First, what procedures are needed to manage and minimize your impact, impacts of your activities? What procedures do you already have in place and where, are there, where may there be some controls missing? When a procedure is not implemented as required, why? Um, again, to the last slide. There, there are reasons if a procedure isn't being followed, you want to figure out what those reasons are and then deal with them appropriately. Um, either change the procedure or step up the training, um, whatever may be appropriate given the controls that you want to have in place. And based on the cause, um, a system-based resolution as well, you want a preventive and a corrective action um, depending on what the issue is. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Next slide. Uh, some operational activities are conducted without procedures. Depends on your operation, depends on the risk. Um, there can be a variety of reasons why a particular organization may decide to have things conducted and not have the procedure written down. And that's perfectly acceptable. The, the question that you want to ask yourself is, is there a consistent understanding of how things are supposed to work? And do things work consistently regardless of who is doing them? Um, if it's important that things be done in a certain order or done in a certain way, you want to make sure that as employees change, even if the procedure isn't written down, that it is still followed. So are there checks and balances in place, like training or checklists or inspections that confirm it's occurring the way you want it to occur, despite the fact that there is no procedure? And does the evidence that you can find show that the activity is occurring consistently? Um, if a key report person, um, responsible person won the lottery in Skip Town, and this goes back to our hero. Often things can be working beautifully at a plant, but they're on the shoulder of one person. And if that person is sick or in an accident or whatever have you, um, you don't want the system to cease to fail. So you really want to make sure that there are backups for key responsibilities. People know what to do when a key person is missing, such that um, some things are going to continue to occur. Uh, and this is true whether you have a procedure for written for the activity or whether it's one for which there is no procedure. Next slide. 
common system failures that we see regarding operational procedures and activities. Um, compliance requirements may not be clearly translated. So you've got an environmental manager that knows what needs to be done, knows it really well, but the folks that need to implement against that requirement may not be as may not as clearly understand what needs to be done. So you want to make sure that everyone that has a role to play in a particular activity clearly understands what needs to be done. And it's usually useful for them to understand why as well. Um, systems may not be in place to ensure consistent reporting. So again, um, the report may be done by a particular person. Um, it may be done with a particular trigger. And if the person or the trigger is missing, the report's filed late. So you want to make sure that somewhere in your system something triggers to make sure that the reports are filed regardless of who's doing them or what the triggers for them are. Uh, procedures exist, but they're not current. And so um, you're walking around a facility and you've got a new employee and he wants to know how to do a particular activity and he goes and gets a procedure, but it's two or three versions ago. Um, that's actually not all that uncommon. It's getting more, it's getting less common with the advent of things being um, wired and electronic as opposed to paper copies. Verification, um, not being done routinely can be um, a key one. If if employees are feeling as though the procedure's there but nobody really cares whether it's followed, it's not checked, um, following the procedure, the details of the procedure, especially if it's a complex one, can wane. Um, so it's important to have the, the checks and balances in place so that folks see you coming around, see you checking, know that you care about that particular procedure. And then lastly, a common failure is with a change. Um, I've seen many systems that are functioning really, really well, and it looks like everything is clicking along just exactly the way you would want it to. And then there's a change, and it becomes very apparent that the checks and balances that are supposed to catch and, and adapt to the change are not in place and are not functioning. So one of the key places you can go to check to see if your system is working is follow a change. Um, a new contractor came in, a new chemical was ordered, a new employee came in, whatever it may be, and then look at the system elements that follow that person and see if they're continuing to work around the change. Next slide. All right, the next step for monitoring and measuring, the next one we're going to talk about is contractor activities. A lot of facilities have contractors that are key to the operations on site. Um, you want to go observe a contractor performing a procedure-driven activity the same way you would with your staff. You want to sample your contractors who've worked on site and see how environmental requirements were incorporated into their contracts or communicated to them and see how you evaluate the performance of your contractors. Contractors are just the same as our employees. If they're checked and watched, um, the adherence to the procedures is going to be higher than if they're not. You also want to interview employees and review incident logs to see if there have been any incidents where contractors were involved. Um, if there were, you can follow that incident through the system to see where the system failed and implement a, uh, a fix to, to solve the problem. Next slide. Questions to consider when you're um, evaluating contractor activities, monitoring and measuring contact activ contractor activities. How do you ensure that vendors are complying with the environmental contract requirements that you have? Um, if you do have environmental requirements in your contracts, there should be a way to verify that the contractors are meeting them. And how do you communicate the expectations to the contractors? Often, um, many facilities I've seen, there's a contract that's signed, the contractors are brought on site, um, and they may or may not fully understand what you are expecting of them. Um, so you want to you explore that process and make sure that you have systems in place to communicate with them and monitor them and make sure that they understand what it is that you expect. Next slide. Okay, common system failures with contractor selection and use. Um, often you will see environmental risks that are not routinely considered during, considered during your contractor selection. You'll be looking for time. You'll be looking for price. Um, would would um, seriously recommend also looking for environmental performance and, and selecting contractors based at least in part on that. The environmental expectations of contractors need to be communicated to them. Um, it is not uncommon to see contractors doing things with, without um, having been told exactly what it is is expected of them. Uh, and responsibilities for overseeing contractors working on site. So a contractor comes on but may not have a site point of contact, may not know to who to go to with questions. Um, and you want to make sure that, that folks that are especially ones that have environmentally sensitive tasks on site 
um, know exactly who to go to with a question and have someone that is coming to check on them to make sure that they have what they need. Next slide. All right, employee roles and responsibilities, monitoring and measuring of that topic. Um, with roles and responsibilities, um, the key is to make sure that individuals have designated backups for their responsibilities and that those individuals are knowledgeable that they are the backup and are familiar with what they need to do to complete it. Um, again, when you go out into the facility and you walk around, when you look for change, look for someone on vacation, look for someone who's sick. Um, and then look at the activity that they were responsible for and see if it continues to happen in their absence. Um, have people received proper training in the areas for which they have responsibility? Does the backup have the training to do what it is that they're being asked to do? Um, usually the answer will be yes, but you want to make sure you have a system in place to ensure that that happens. Um, and if there is a performance problem, is it due to confusion about who was responsible? Again, if, if you see something that isn't working, Look to see if it's due to the fact that someone didn't know what was expected of them or, or a backup wasn't aware that they were a backup. Um, that will tie to elements of your system, including training and awareness, the operational controls. Um, but it, it isn't uncommon when something does go wrong to, to see that it was due to some sort of change or um, a backup person not having the knowledge or the, or the ability to implement a task that they were expected by management to implement. Next slide. Questions to, to consider when you're doing monitoring and measuring. Um, and these are key questions that you can ask yourself as you're trying to monitor and measure your employee roles and responsibilities. Are roles and responsibilities of key staff on site who manage environmental issues clearly defined? Um, and, and really dig into that one, because you may think they are, but as you as you reach out to your staff, you may realize that your perception and theirs are somewhat different. Are designated backups assigned? How are people made aware of their responsibilities? Does someone tell them in a tailgate, or do they have formal training? Are they evaluated against it annually on their performance? Are they told in advance that they will be evaluated against it? How are individuals held accountable for carrying out their assigned responsibilities? Is it tied to a performance review? Um, are there consequences if, if something isn't done? If you have three shifts and there is a, a to be done every shift, and two shifts routinely do it, and the third routinely doesn't and doesn't do it, and the first one comes in and just covers for the person who didn't do it in the third shift, is that is the person in the third shift held, held responsible for that, held accountable, or are they just is it just well that's just Joe and, and they let it go? Um, make sure that there are consequences and rewards and recognition and, and um, results based on um, people being held accountable for what they're, what they're being expected to do. Uh, what roles do the management team play in reinforcing the importance of the environmental management system? You can have a mid-level person responsible for the system um, beating the drum fairly loudly, but until senior management says, guys, this is something we really care about, we're going to be on top of it. We're going to monitor it. We're going to make sure it's being done. We're going to ask management if it's being accomplished. We're going to track it. Um, the, the results of the implementation can be a little sketchy until senior management really gets on board. So you do, if, to the extent that you can, you want to make sure that your senior management is reinforcing with your employees the importance of the system and the importance of the role they play. And then lastly, well, second to last, are resources adequate? And by resources, we don't just mean financial. It can be specialized skills. It can be technology. It can be people. But do the folks that you are expecting to complete tasks have what they need to complete that task? Uh, and then lastly, a management representative has been designated with responsibility to oversee the implementation of EMS. The one caution I would have there is you really want them to be somebody that is going to empower others to implement the system and not just do it themselves. Next slide. Common system failures with employee roles and responsibilities. Um, this is going to sound a little bit repetitive, but again, roles and responsibilities have not been clearly defined or documented. One key person is responsible, and there is no backup behind them so that when they are not available or something happens, the activity doesn't get accomplished. Responsibilities are defined, but people are not held accountable for carrying them out. Uh, Non-management personnel have been assigned management responsibilities, but they don't have the authority or the budget or the resources. Uh, you need to make sure that the tasks are appropriate to the level of authority that the individual has. 
And then lastly, resources required to perform specific tasks required to implement the system are not provided. Again, resources being not just financial. Next slide. Okay, now on to monitoring and measuring documentation and record keeping. Uh, documentation and record keeping is one of those areas where a lot of facilities get hung up. Um, the, you can have a really good system. Um, if, you're, if you have an ISO system, it's going to be heavier on the documentation and the record keeping. I've seen lots of facilities minimize the documentation and record keeping to just the absolute minimum that they have to have to ensure that it works and have it work really, really well. So documentation and record keeping is something you really want to make sure is, is targeted right to what you want to accomplish, meets your needs, but doesn't go overboard, because this one can quickly get out of control. Uh, how are documents created, reviewed for approval, and kept current? Um, is there a procedure for document creation, review, and maintenance? And what determines the frequency of the review and the revision? You want to make sure that the documents, and again, the documents are what says what your system is going to do. Um, you want to make sure that the documents are current, that they are reviewed routinely, that they are revised as necessary, and that you have a system in place to make sure that the most current version of the document is available to those who may need them. Obsolete documents can be kept often for um, historical purposes, but you want to make sure that they are marked as obsolete so that somebody doesn't as absolute accidentally think that that's the procedure they should be following. Uh, who has responsibility for maintaining environmental records, and is there a backup? And how do you ensure that records that you keep for the, are kept for the retention times required by regulation or company policy? Um, you can, there can be a benefit to keeping things longer, but there can also be a benefit to um, removing them at the point that the period of time that you expect that they are retained, they are removed. That's a company policy, company decision, but it is one that should be made and, and kept to. Next slide. The key document to have is the EMS manual. Um, it is a roadmap that describes how your system works. Um, it should explain how your organization implements the criteria. You don't necessarily have to have a single manual. You can get by with multiple smaller documents. Um, I've seen both work in the field. The, sorry about that. The, um, while you don't have to have a single manual, you do want to make sure that the documents that you have describe the system's core elements and how they relate to each other and provides direction to the related documentation. Next slide. This is an example from uh, an organization that I have worked with. This is their corporate EMS manual. As you can see, it's pretty darn small. They really limited it to just those critical elements that they needed for the system to function. Not a lot of extra language, not a lot of extraneous words, just the meat of how they expected the system to function. The next slide is the facility um, equivalent of that management system. This was the, um, they called it a SEMP, a Site Environmental Management Plan. Um, this was how the individual facility implemented the corporate expectations. Um, and all of, the, all of the elements here, you can see it's a little bit longer, but still pretty, pretty um, truncated, pretty limited in the, in the volume and the size. Um, again, to the key elements of what they expect to have happen as part of the system. Next slide. Other EMS documentation that you want to make sure you have handy if it's not in a manual is um, an overall policy and an environmental policy. You may have a sustainability policy. You may have a waste policy. Whatever policies are part of your system, you want to make sure you have documented and, and people have access to them. You want to make sure that your organizational structure and key responsibilities are described so that people know who's responsible for what and when. Um, you want to make sure you've identified your environmental aspects, um, your control documents, and be able to demonstrate how you comply with legal requirements. Uh, you want to have a list or documentation of your system level procedures as well as your process specific procedures and work instructions. Um, and any other important documents that you need to show how the system functions, such as an emergency plan or a training plan. And keeping in mind that the documentation shows how the system works, the records, which we will talk about next, show what you've done, what you're actually doing, shows that what you expect to have happen is happening. Next slide. All right, evaluation of the documentation. When you're looking at documentation and, and trying to see whether you have what you want to have and whether it's working, 
you want to look for evidence to see if current versions of the documents are available to people or whether they're outdated um, copies in, in uh, control rooms. Somewhere in the system, it should tell you where copies of documents are maintained. Um, and when I was an auditor for um, ISO, um, one, of my, one of my things to do was to walk around and look at all of the places where the plans were supposed to be um, and see if the folks that were going to be relying on those had the current ones in their hands. Um, you want to review a sample of various EMS, do EMS documents to determine if they're le legible, if they're handwritten. Can you read them? Um, do you know when they were prepared? Are they, is there a date associated with them or a revision associated with them? And can you verify that it is the most current version? Are they readily identifiable for what they are? Does it say training plan? Does it say emergency response plan? Or is it a couple of pieces of paper that someone might really not realize what it was that they were looking at? Um, are things maintained in an orderly manner? Are they retained for the specific period of time that the document control procedure, if there is one, says they should be retained for? And that are they updated um, based on facility changes? So again, um, back to your change. Look for a recent change at your facility. If you have a system in place and you think it's functioning, look for a recent change and see if the system worked around the recent change. Um, once you are getting a new control in place, it's a great way to check the system to see if it's functioning as well. Um, and um, determine whether any training is required, and if the training is required, has it been completed, and are there, is there documentation and records to show that. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so what, actually, uh, can you go back one? Sorry. OK. Um, for, this is now for record keeping, not documentation. But a lot of the questions that you're going to ask and, and look at are the same. Are the records well legible? Um, it's not uncommon if a record's being kept in a control shack or in an um, unloading area for it to be outside and exposed to the elements or in a very small shack where it can get beaten up. Um, you want to make sure that if it's a record, especially if it's one that's required for regulation, that you can see um, what has been written. You know who signed it. You can document that the things have been happening. Um, if you are um, looking at records, if you're visiting a facility that isn't your own and you ask to see a record, can they produce it? Um, are there folks around that know where those records are kept? And if somebody is asking, can they, can they make it available? Um, not uncommon, unfortunately, to have some records maintained under lock and key in somebody's office. Uh, and not have anybody as a backup so a regulator can come in, ask to see something, and you actually will not be able to put your hands on it. And you want to avoid that situation if you can. You want to protect the records against damage or loss. Make sure retention times are established and maintained. Um, and where changes occur, uh, a new person is monitoring an unloading process. Does the record that's being maintained, show you know, a change in the names, and, and the person that you know is supposed to be there and supposed to be responsible knows that they're supposed to sign the record and maintain it. Um, you also want to check to see if training records for key individuals with EMS responsibilities demonstrate consistency against the training provided. So if you know they've had the training, are they, are they following the training and are they performing in a way that you would expect them to do given that they've had the training? Next slide. What records should you, should you have? Well, it really, it's going to be determined by your operations. It's going to be determined by your management. It's going to be determined by the regulations that apply to you. Uh, this is a list um, from, of some of the more common ones that I'm used to seeing, depending on what the facility does. Um, but you're going to want copies of the legal requirements somewhere handy. You're going to want copies of your aspect and impact identification, your training records, your inspection records, um, any spill or incident reports. I mean, you can read, you can read the list. Um, but again, the records that you maintain should tie to the critical aspects and impacts that you have identified and the controls that you have put in place. If there's a control, you probably want a record to show that the control is occurring. Next slide. Common system failures in documentation and record keeping are obsolete documents that are not removed from operational areas of use. Um, Often, if you've got a new person coming in, you could end up in a situation where they're looking at an older document that isn't reflecting the way things are currently supposed to occur. So you really want to try to make sure that you've got a system in place to get obsolete documents out of use. Um, documents are not routinely reviewed, revised, or approved for adequacy. Um, 
sign-off dates, revision numbers, so that folks that are using them really know that they're using the most current version. Record retention times are not defined. Um, and this, it depends on your industry, depends on your company, depends on the policies you have in place, but this one can, can be an issue. So um, if there are record retention times determined, you really do want to try to make sure that you have systems in place to make sure that the records that are on site are those that are supposed to be there. Records are not maintained in an orderly or identifiable manner. Um, so uh, to the example that I mentioned, if a person is out um, and a regulatory inspection occurs, other folks cannot locate the records for the inspector. Um, that can go to um, that your uh, roles and responsibilities in your backup. Um, or it could, it could go to um, someone just not being familiar with where something is kept. And records do not provide traceability to the activity that the record is intended to document. Um, you can have a checklist that says inspected, date and time, but no title up at the top that says what it was that you were inspecting. So records can get mixed up and you will not necessarily be able to demonstrate that that record went with that activity. So you want to make sure that there is a link between the record that you're maintaining and the activity that is intended to reflect. Next slide. All right, monitoring and measuring evaluation best practices. Spot check your problem areas more frequently. Um, that sort of goes without saying, but if you've got an area that is giving you headaches, get out and check that one a little bit more frequently than the others. Involve as many people as you possibly can with the area and the activities. You don't want the monitoring and measuring to be in the hands of one or two people. You want it to be in the hands of anyone that has the ability to oversee the activity, and the more the better, because the more robust your system will be. You do want to watch activities involving contractors. They're on your site. They're operating on your behalf. In many instances, they're handling sensitive chemicals or materials. Um, and if they make a mistake, the liability um, can, can fold back to you. So you do want to make sure that you're, you're managing them appropriately. Uh, an annual system review, I know that for ISO and for other systems, the, the management review is required to be done once a year. Um, systems can get out of whack very quickly. Um, so for the systems that I was responsible for managing, we did, do, um, we did a self-assessment once a year. The major review might be every two or three years, but the self-assessment of the system that I involved my staff with was done on an annual basis. Um, it helped us to make sure, helped to us to ensure that the system was functioning the way it needed to, to function. And we did develop and use a self-assessment tool unique to our facility that targeted those areas that we knew we wanted to be assessing. Um, don't do's. Um, I wouldn't notify folks when you're observing them. You really want to make sure that you're seeing the way they routinely do it, not the way they do it when they know they're being observed. Um, and I wouldn't limit employee observations to just new hires. Um, it's sort of uh, so people will go look at the new hires because they're not sure that they should be doing that they are going to be doing it the way they should. By all means, look at the new hires, but don't stop there. Um, you want to make sure that your routine seasoned employees are being observed as well to make sure that they're following the systems that you want in place. Next slide. All right, this is a self-assessment working tool, again, borrowed from a facility that I worked with. Um, on the left, documents to review. On the right, what they were being reviewed for. It's not complete. Um, this is a snapshot of a 10 or 12 page document. Um, it, obviously, the whole thing wouldn't sit on the slide. So I just want, I wanted to give you guys a sense of how we triggered the assessment that we were doing, um, whether like for chemical unloading procedure, compare to records for process verification and inspection logs, compare to actual implementation. Pick the document, pick the system, and then follow it through the path and go look and see if it's functioning the way you want it to function. Again, starting small and, and expanding as you get the system in place and as you have time. Next slide. Checking, correcting, and preventing. Once the system is, is in place, um, you've got in controls in place, you're assessing to see if things are working, that's your check. Um, where they're not working, you've identified a problem, you want to determine a corrective and a preventive action. Um, Charlotte made mention earlier of a drum that had the wrong label on it. So you fix the label on the drum. But you've got to figure out why it had the wrong label. Um, was somebody sick? Was the person that is doing it, were they not properly trained? Uh, were they just not paying attention? But figure out what the, what the root
Angela, it sounds like we may have lost audio. Yeah, we lost Ann's audio. Okay. Why don't we uh, see if she'll help me call back in. Uh, maybe you can send her a quick note. Yeah. Charlotte, I don't know if you'd like to step in and take us through the next couple of slides. I think we're close to the end, and then we can open it up for some question and answer. All right, Angela, why don't you go ahead and flip to our next slide. And Okay, let's stand by here, folks. Well, while we have a pause, would folks like to uh, send in a question. Ken, I'm back. Sorry. No oh. idea what happened. I realized I wasn't there when I said next slide and nothing changed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry looks like that. everyone's back. Uh, their phones went uh, dead for a second, but everybody's back online, so continue okay. on. Okay. Checking, correcting, and preventing. I'll just pick up with the slides since I don't know exactly where I uh, got cut off. Um, you've identified what needs to change, so now you've got to make sure that the problem is fixed. So once the problem is identified, you want to identify a corrective and a preventive action. As Charlotte mentioned earlier, if you've got a drum that has the wrong label on it, you want to fix the label on the drum, but you also want to figure out why the label on the drum was the wrong one initially. Assign responsibility for fixing the problem, allocate resources, track progress to make sure that the corrective action is, is implemented, and then if there's any document um, changes that need to be made, you want to make sure that the documents are updated. Next slide. Maybe on Angela's end. Did we lose Angela? No, I'm still here. OK. Oh, you... Hold on. Hold on. Oops, too far. Yeah, sorry. I had my screen frozen. OK. All right, so with checking, correcting, and preventing, you do want to maintain a corrective action log. Um, it helps you to keep track of everything that needs to be done. If your facility is anything like the ones that I've worked at, it's, it's going to be long. So um, you, you want to make sure that you have an ability to track the things that you want to get fixed. Um, you want to know who, what, when, and how. Um, you want to identify a corrective action and a preventive action and a target date for each and a responsible individual for each. Um, and you want to note what procedures, training, or documentation will need to be updated or changed to reflect the, uh, the corrective action that you're making. Um, you do want to make sure that you have somebody responsible for the update and that you have a date for when it needs to be completed by. Next slide. That's it. Um, contact information for myself and for Charlotte are here, um, both email and um, phone number. And again, uh, as you guys are going through all this, I know it can be overwhelming. Be more than happy to make myself available to answer questions that you may have as you're, as you're working through it. Great. Thank you, Anne and Charlotte, for your presentation. And uh, appreciate the uh, level of detail you provided us today. I think it's going to be a useful document for folks to go back. And it, it may be a little overwhelming from a first look at it. And, but uh, it's better to have something more comprehensive, I think. Um, so while folks are thinking of a couple questions, um, one I wanted to kind of put out there is, is that you know we have uh, folks involved in very large organizations to you know smaller you know small businesses basically that may have one person that has to you know wear many hats um, do you have any suggestions for how someone at the smaller level small to medium sized level kind of deals with a lot of these issues that you brought up um, in terms of, of of an approach or how to work effectively with employees um, since they seem to be a big part of the success of the overall EMS. 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's interesting. Most of the, well, many of the companies that I've worked with are large. Um, their facilities and, and individual sites tend to be smaller. Um, a lot of the work I've done has been with power companies, which will be running with a staff of 22 to 25, they're, and they're around the clock. They're tight. Um, you want to, again, you want to, you want to make it systematic as best you can, and you want to start, start simply. Really pick those things. I mean, obviously, the logical place to start is with the elements that are required for compliance, because you want to make sure that you're in compliance. So build the system around compliance first, and then expand it. Um, the, the smaller facilities, you often have people that are willing to wear a lot of different hats um, because it's a smaller, more family atmosphere. Um, folks like responsibility. They like to have ownership of something. And so finding that energetic person that is passionate about documentation or passionate about training um, and putting them to work, giving them the responsibility and then letting, letting them fly with it. Um, really is the best way to do it for a system um, and, and for a smaller company where, where resources and people are tighter. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll take any questions that folks may have from the audience. We are running into lunch hour here, but we'll, we can stay on for a couple more minutes. There's a so. question. Is there a list of the top five or ten problems that occur in audits? I, I could come up with um, common ones that I, I have seen from the assessments that I've done. I actually think I would defer that question to the folks on the auditing roundtable, um, which is going to be the, the webinars that come up in the, in the January, February time frame. Uh, only because they that's what they do. Um, and in terms of giving a sense of what is most common and what is most routine, their, um, their experience is going to be broader uh, and probably more representative. Um, the, the audits that I've done, that I've seen, it is the time and time and time again comes back to roles and responsibilities or change. Um, there's been a change at the facility that, that the system wasn't up to managing for whatever reason, um, or the roles and responsibilities are so tight, and this does go back to the idea of a smaller company, um, you really may not have backups for particular things, um, or um, you're only able to back up a couple of key, um, key roles. So um, for, for those, those are the two that I have seen sort of again and again and again. I guess I would add contractor management to that one because the facilities that I've worked at, a lot, of the, a lot of the challenges that we have had, our own employees know what we expect, but contractors, you know, they come in and they don't necessarily see it as their site. Um, so the, the controls around contractors can sometimes be important. And could you speak to a little bit about our next webinar, which should be focusing more on the communications and engagement piece. Have you had some thoughts on, as you think about putting that together? Absolutely. Um, what we are going to be doing is tapping into some of the companies that are members of SAC. Um, we're going to tap into some larger ones and some smaller ones as well. Um, I am in dialogue right now with Johnson & Johnson and 3M, uh, as well as a couple of others. Um, they have examples of how they have communicated externally or internally of stakeholder engagement, of employee engagement, of systems and programs that have worked for them. And we were going to build that um, presentation around their experiences and the information that they can share about how they've done it and what's worked and what's been a challenge. Mm -hmm. right, well, we'll be looking forward to that, and that's coming up on December 4th. So uh, folks can go ahead and... Uh, We'll be posting that here shortly to be able to go ahead and get registered for that in, uh, after today. And we'll also get the uh, PowerPoint presentation today posted up. I apologize for that not being up already. Um, but we'll get that posted to the web as quickly as we can. Speaking of web, and you know, as things have developed, uh, I guess there are more use of the internet to help uh, standardize some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, you, but then again, you still need to find that human side of the element <laughs> in terms of, of you know, the focus on paper versus getting out in the, into the facility 
Mm -hmm. Did you speak to that? You know, as you've seen things evolve over the over the years. It the, the more the more sort of technology savvy um, the employees or the company are, the easier it is to rely on. Um, electronic versions, and certainly where there are electronic versions and there are control copies kept online and people can just get to a computer and, and log in and get it. Um, the controls I've seen have been you print it out and it basically it's obsolete the moment you use it, um, so you don't keep it, um, and the current versions are online. That works really well if you're in an industry where folks have access to the computer um, or are computer savvy. Um, again, coming from the power side of the house, um, the guys that are that are out working on the lines or um, are in trucks are not going to have immediate access to computers. So for them, if they need a procedure written down, it's got to be a paper copy. Mm -hmm. So it's really going to depend on the organization that you're with, the type of operations that you have. Um, certainly where you can rely on electronic versions, it, it really helps with the document control and obsolete versions. Um, but not every organization or, or um, industry is able to do that, depending on the type of operations that they have. All right. Um. We do have a question that's come in. Um, the person says that they've been adding MILVA as ISO certified since 2007, and they've seen some significant improvement since um, implementation despite the amount of paperwork. However, they've set up a few of the documents as overly cumbersome and would like to improve or simplify. One specific is how to tie the key characteristics of aspect to operational controls. Does stewardship action provide consulting or provide example documents so that they can see how others might do it better? It's a really good question. Um, no, we're, we are not a consulting firm. Um, we do have members. The, the organization is dedicated to helping companies work with each other um, to better the act activities and operations that they have on the ground. The um, membership is facility-based, and we do have webinars once a month or once every other month. We have a members-only portion of the website, um, and all of the contact information for every, all of our members is available to other members. So in an instance where you wanted to reach out to another member of SAC to ask them that specific question, SAC is set up to enable you to do that. Um, in terms of... I. I commiserate with the documentation. I, and I know, um, I know many companies that have actually opted not to do ISO because of the documentation element and because there wasn't a business reason to do so. There are a lot more industries now that are facing business drivers for ISO, and that's triggering the full system, and the documentation can be overwhelming. Um, I do know that there are, I mean, other companies are obviously struggling with that as well. Specific examples of what folks have done, no. Um, off, off the top of my head, I don't. Um, but if that individual wants to email me, um, we can talk about it a little bit further, and I'd, be, I'd certainly be happy to reach out to the SAC membership and see if I could get someone who might have struggled with it and feel as though they've tackled it that you could speak with directly. Okay, well, that's takes us uh, to close out this session, I think, at this point. And again, thanks, Anne and Charlotte and Angela uh, at the National Roundtable and Stewardship Action Council for putting this on. Our, uh, I did check our website. It looks like uh, the PowerPoint presentation is posted. And um, you can also go ahead and register for the December 4th. And that will be at 10 AM Pacific Standard Time. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing everyone next month. With that, we'll go ahead and close out the webinar today. Thanks so much. Thank you.